modern communication technology in Shark Tank. Thank you for that introduction, Nick, and thank you all for coming. It's extremely gratifying to see so many enthusiastic and smart people that care about the future of these animals. You've heard all about, or throughout this conference, you've heard all about how shark species and many other marine organisms are, are in deep trouble. I'm here to tell you about something that we can all be doing, that many of us may not be doing already, that I think could really help. Because this is a shark conservation symposium, and because my background is in shark biology, most of my examples are going to come from that world. But I think you'll find that most of these tools and techniques are broadly applicable to the conservation movement as a whole. The people in this room know how to save sharks. If Sonia and Sarah and Mary and Nick were in charge of, fish, of making the fisheries management policies, then, sure, then we wouldn't need any extra help for these sharks. They'd be in great shape. But that's not how it works in the real world. In the real world, our elected representatives make these decisions. And in democracies, public support helps pass environmental laws. And my question for you all is how can we, as, con as conservationists and scientists, help to inform the public and to organize the public? Because in many cases, this strong public support already exists. People just don't know where to direct it. And in other cases, additional public support could be created if people just had a little bit more information about what was going on. And there are many possible solutions to this problem, but the one I'm going to be speaking about today is modern communication technologies, social, social media technologies, the so-called Web 2.0. The modern internet and various websites make it easier than ever before in all of human history for people to find information and for people to share information with large groups of people. One tool that most of you are probably familiar with is Facebook. But you may not be aware that it, it's useful for more than just wasting time taking care of a virtual farm or keeping in touch with your friends from uh, high school. <laughs> there are more than half a billion people in 200 countries around the world that, that use Facebook. And according to Facebook, more than 50% of them check their page at least every other day. This is a huge audience that we can be reaching. Many of you know that uh, that on Facebook you can post links on your Facebook wall. Sometimes these are about sports or politics, but they can be about science or conservation. You can see, can you all hear me if I stand over here for a second? You can see my Facebook wall, I posted a recent article about shark conservation. This is prim we, posting things on your own wall is primarily useful for just educating your friends, because that's the only people who can see your wall. But that can be incredibly useful. I can tell you, for example, that my barber, my usual waitress at the pizza shop around the corner from my house, all of these people are now committed shark conservationists. <laughs> <laughs> but we want to reach these 500 million users. And there are ways that you can reach more of them using the embedded free tools in Facebook. <coughs> these, some of these are called fan pages or groups. Any business, celebrity, conservation NGO, or any kind of NGO, or lab group or university can create a fan page. I pictured here the IUCN Shark Specialist Group's fan page. And any individual can create a group. There are more than 900 million fan pages and groups on Facebook. And many of these deal with science and conservation. But there could be more. And I think there should be more. These are very useful for distributing information to people that are interested in learning about it. On the, I, I'm not sure how well you can read it here. But on the IUCN Shark Specialist Group page, they post uh, recent shark science articles, as well as uh, proceedings of the sh shark, sh shark specialist group, working groups, things like that. Very useful. Another tool is causes. These are similar to groups, but they have extra advantages. They allow fundraising, and they allow for the administrators to send mass emails. I have pictured here my cause that I founded, which is Save the Sharks. We have more than 90,000 members that I can email once a week. And we've raised more than $10,000 for the Shark Research Institute. And that was without any sort of concerted fundraising drive. That was just having the interested in helping donate here button on the page. Uh, there are more than 140 million people that are members of more than half a million of these causes. And in total, they've raised more than $30 million for 27,000 charities in the, in, the, in the only three years since this tool has come onto the scene. 
many of these causes are environmental, but I think there can and should be more environmental causes. Uh, one caveat with these, only an administrator can deal with the fundraising or the mass emails, but if you are a scientist or a representative of an NGO, most administrators are happy to help you. I know I am, and the, through the five causes that I'm the administrator for, I can email over 600,000 people a week. To learn more about my particular cause, causes.com slash save the sharks is the website, or you can search for it from Facebook. A tool you might be less familiar with is Twitter. This is a, a wonderful tool for social networking, sharing, inform and sharing information, and communicating with the public. Up to, it's a microblogging website, they call it, with updates limited to 140 characters. But there are, only, there are over 200 million people who use Twitter, and over 65 million tweets per day. This, again, represents a huge audience that we can reach with science and conservation news. In fact, if you search Twitter for the hashtag IMCC2, you'll find that there have been a couple dozen of your colleagues that have been live tweeting this whole conference. And in fact, if you look, you may see that someone was live tweeting your session. I asked a question of someone in, in, during, after their presentation, and the question did not come from me. It came from one of my Twitter followers who saw what I wrote about what you said. As part of this conference, I, have, I personally have done about over 500 tweets, and I've received over 200 in reply, some about half from people at the conference and about half from my followers around the world. Uh, and many of them have been asking questions, and this is a great way to get the wonderful information that's being shared here at this conference to the world as a whole. It's, it's, also, it's also a great tool for easy, rapid information sharing. Many of you may have heard the story that uh, the recent assassination of Osama bin Laden, that story broke on Twitter about three hours before CNN broke it. And it, we found out later that somebody who lives in the same town was actually complaining about the weird helicopter noises in the middle of the night. He was actually live tweeting the event. But even before that, the story leaked on Twitter three hours before. So this is a source, it can be a source for legitimate news. You can see from my Twitter page here, some recent exports, uh, some concert, this may be broken. <laughs> some conservation news stories, Californians express support for shark finning bill, new, uh, new research about bio, global biodiversity, hot spots for sharks. I also get questions from the general public all the time about this. What's your favorite kind of shark? How can I help? Uh, I'm a fifth grader writing a report about sharks. Can you help me? These are people who had these questions already. Twitter didn't create these questions. Twitter gave these people a way to ask someone who actually knows the answer to these questions. YouTube is actually one of the most viewed websites on the internet. Uh, most of you are familiar with it. Yep, several, uh, several people who are in this room are, are featured here on my YouTube page. I, I post interviews uh, with shark scientists once a week. YouTube allows users to share multimedia videos with, with the world. There's over 2 billion views every day on YouTube. 300 million people a month visit. This is, again, a huge untapped audience. YouTube likes to say that they, there's more content uploaded every 60 days to YouTube than ABC, NBC, and CBS, the three largest television networks in the United States, created in 60 years. Uh, you've often heard that a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, a video might even be more valuable than that. You can tell someone all day about how brutal shark finning is, but if you show them a video of it, they're convinced. And I do have videos of that on my YouTube page, which is youtube.com slash why sharks matter. I warn you, they are extremely graphic if you've never seen them, but it gets the message across. In my opinion, the most useful Web 2.0 technology is blogging. I write for a science blog called Southern Fried Science. There are a great deal of science and conservation blogs out there, but there's always room for more, and I hope that some of you will consider starting your own. One main advantage of blogs is there's no formal editorial structure. Authors can write about whatever, we want, whatever they want. The first night here at IMCC, many of the wonderful science and environment journalists that were here were asked why they don't write more about these kinds of stories. And invariably, when I've heard that question asked, uh, journalists replied, well, I'd love to, but my editors don't let me. We don't have that problem. Bloggers can focus on issues that the mainstream media either can, uh, cannot afford to spend time covering or has, or has stopped covering. Uh, a great example of this is, other than a recent flurry of coverage of the one-year anniversary, 
you wouldn't know from watching the evening news or reading the newspaper that there are still ecological effects going on in the Gulf of Mexico as a result of the oil spill. But Deep Sea News, a, a, a writer for which is sitting in the back over here live tweeting my talk because I can't be doing that, uh, they, they publish a weekly or sometimes monthly update of what's been going on in the oil spill. Blogs also allow scientists and conservationists to directly communicate with the public and sometimes with policymakers with no filter. This can be used to unite and organize the public, as there are many people around the world who deeply care about sharks, and they would love to call an elected representative, or sign a petition, or send a letter in support, but they don't necessarily know who to send the letter to, or who to call, or what to say. Blogs can be very useful for this, and as a quick case study, uh, Shark Defenders, which is a, a shark conservation NGO, several months ago asked for my help and the, uh, on Southern Fried Science and the help of several other blogs in generating, in generating support for a proposed shark conservation law in Guam. Their shark defenders had been working on the ground there for many months to generate support, and, they, and suddenly they received a great deal of pushback from the fishing community, and they said if we could get a big show of support from the global community, it would really help. So I put this blog post up, and uh, several other blogs did as well, and within 72 hours, about 5,000 emails were sent to the president of Guam's Senate, saying, hey, I'm not, not threatening, not mean, not anything like that, just saying, hey, I heard you're considering passing this shark conservation law, I really wish you would, I love sharks, uh, South Pacific is great and I'd love to visit one day, just nice things, encouragement. And as, as the policy folks in this audience know, that law passed, and shark defenders credited a large part of that to support from the online community. In summary, tools like, uh, tools like blogs and YouTube are used for creating content, while Facebook, Causes, and Twitter are useful more for distributing content. And just a, a quick note about Southern Fried Science, I couldn't, I couldn't resist saying this. This, wrote, this fluctuates from week to week, but this week's Southern Fried Science is in fact the most widely read science blog in the world. Uh, that, we're, usually, we're usually in the top 20, but this week for a, a fluke that I'm happy to tell you about when I'm not on camera here, we happen to, be, uh, happen to be number one. So a major theme of this conference, is that two minutes? Yeah. A major theme of this conference has been making marine science matter, getting our information to the public and to policymakers. I think social media technology facilitates that, and I hope that everyone here will use it if you're not already. If you want to learn, I'm happy to teach you how. But I recently learned a great analogy from United States Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, who is a leading ocean conservation advocate that I got to interview for Southern Fried Science. He used the analogy of the firefighters. In any community from time to time, a fire might break out. This might be a literal fire in a literal community, or in the conservation community, it might be a developer trying to build a mega resort right next to an MPA, or someone spewing some garbage about climate change. When those fires break out, everyone in your community does not need to be a firefighter, but you better hope there's someone who is, because otherwise a lot of things that you've worked really hard to build are going to burn down. And along those lines, I'm happy to, I'm happy to offer you my services here as your broader impacts. If you are interested in the benefits of social media technology, but do not have the time or the energy to devote to creating your own social media, I am happy to do it for you. If you contact me with the information that you want to get out there, I will either write a blog post for you, or in some cases we can, have, we can let you write a guest blog post. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are uh, more old-fashioned, I do have a stack of business cards up here, but I'll have my, I'll have my, I'll have my digital contact info at the end. But before, uh, be before I finish up real quick, I just wanted to thank Every, a, a great deal of people for organizing this, particularly Nick and Lucy of the IUCN Shark Specialist Group for organizing this wonderful symposium. I hope that many of you will stick around for the panel discussion from 7 to 9 in this room. Also, the Save Our Seas Foundation for travel support, the Deep Sea News and Southern Fried Science community, uh, my, my blogging friends, the American Elasmobranch Society, the primary society in, the, in North America for shark scientists, shark and ray scientists, uh, that has given me this great title of online outreach coordinator that lets me to help you guys in this way. 
the graduate program in marine biology at the College of Charleston for putting up with me while I played around on Facebook instead of doing my master's thesis. And here's how, here's all the different ways you can get in touch with me. And again, I have, uh, I have a stack of business cards up here if you need help later. <laughs>